Welcome uh, to the optical profiler characterizations of advanced materials using white light interferometry. I'm uh, Samuel Lesko from Bruker. Uh, I will host uh, the webinar uh, today. So I'd like to thank you uh, for attending uh, this technical webinars that will concern uh, about the white light interferometry uh, profilers used not only to measure topography but thanks to his uh, core benefits of uh, vertical and lateral resolutions, we want to use it uh, to characterize advanced uh, materials uh, using optical path difference or correlations with other techniques. Today, we will have three speakers, uh, myself, Alexander Nemerov Müller from the KIT uh, in um, uh, Karlsruhe, uh, Germany, and uh, uh, Professor Andreas Ludger from Marum University uh, of Bremen, and again from Germany. So uh, today, uh, everyone will be muted. Uh, whenever you will have question, please feel free uh, to answer, to bring your question into the question box uh, that uh, is available to you, and we will answer those questions into a dedicated. Uh, time at the end of, of the talk. So today we'll start with uh, some kind of uh, overview uh, through myself and then I will hand over the presentation to Alexander who will just uh, use the white light interferometry profilers to measure potential interactions uh, between um, uh, antigen and, and antibodies. We will finish with a third talk from Andreas uh, that will talk about uh, everything uh, uh, dealing with corrosions and correlating optical profilers topography together with uh, micro Raman uh, mapping and uh, spectroscopy. So, as uh, today, uh, we will uh, move to the uh, overview and uh, I will be responsible to run this uh, talk. So I will bring to you a brief uh, overview about how uh, our uh, optical profilers based on white line interferometry has been used by our own user or ourselves to characterize aluminum corrosion for instance or uh, working uh, with 2D materials and especially uh, graphene as much as going really away from topography measurements and characterizing uh, light guide which is a uh, topic uh, regarding some advances in uh, um, semiconductors and finally uh, we will talk about the possibility to measure topography while controlling environmental um, uh, around environmental parameters around the sample such as uh, temperatures or uh, liquids. So if we start with a very simple application which is corrosions, uh, what we can see is measuring topography is essential to understand where corrosions occurs. So, so this is a case study where we try to find out whether the initial roughness of the aluminum substrate plays a role into the corrosion uh, through some um, sulfuric uh, acid. So in that case what you see is a smooth aluminum uh, topography while you get some kind of rougher uh, surface and all of them are plot uh, with the same lateral size as well as same vertical scale such as you can really compare the differences and whenever it's corroded at the initial state the good point from topography is you start to qualitatively see some differences on both smooth and, and rough surfaces uh, especially uh, over there. But in general, first of all, the topography type did not dramatically change. Uh, you still get something which is smooth there or rough um, at the first glance. However, what we see in details is the corroded state bring some extra micro roughness 
uh, on this smooth surface why initial uh, defect uh, are like peaks or crack we saw at the initial surfaces start to reveal initial pitting uh, phenomena. So in that case uh, topography helps to understand the process. What we can do as well is have ability to check out corrosion on same locations versus time. So in that case we will use the aluminium um, plate and move it inside a, a sulfuric acid and come back to the same location. For that purpose we have designed a special fixtures with uh, three uh, points that helps to uh, slide the sample in the same uh, orientations in same locations and on top of that we use the software capabilities to define specific measurement location like one, two, three relatively to some reference point such as we definitively and precisely come back to the same locations. So in, in that case what we see is initial surface has a certain uh, scratches, some uh, curve uh, and pits there already and get a, a overall mean roughness around 1 microns. So if we start to expose 10 minutes of the surface or 20 minutes or 30 minutes uh, what we see is an increase of the roughness coming from 1 microns to mean roughness around 2.6 so we have almost 2.5x time rougher surfaces. What we see as well is repositioning works very well because we can still find out this initial mark however as you can see is whenever uh, we go to a higher uh, corrosion rate uh, it's very challenging to find out uh, any other specific details except relying on the positionings you set up previously. In that case we can see that this uh, roughening happen to small scales and start to expand until it just start to really uh, erase or smooth out some of the uh, details that were present before. But there is an element where sometimes corrosion versus the uh, initial roughness start to play a very subtle role. So it's very challenging uh, to really quantify this role and there is also questions from the material science perspective on what kind of scale the phenomena play uh, a role. So what you see here is the aluminum stripe with very strong surface textures that start to be corroded with longer and longer time. But as you can see um, obviously it's challenging to uh, put in numbers uh, because the mean uh, roughness will almost remain uh, equal. So in that case what we'll do is we will extract from the image the full power spectrum density which plots the roughness versus the spatial frequencies and we see in blue the native uh, power spectrum densities where uh, here we have a low um, uh, spatial frequency so basically waviness uh, very slow changing topography all the way to roughness where we are fast uh, changing what we call micro roughness usually and indeed whenever we start corrosion the, the full image is very meaningful because we see that the overall blue curve has been offset vertically so basically the power is higher so we have a slightly higher roughness and there is a shift along uh, the um, x-axis pushing toward to higher spatial frequencies so basically corrosion creates higher micro roughness create uh, more uh, fine details uh, due to uh, the pitting uh, of the of the corrosion. So with the power spectrum density you have the full uh, story behind it and have ability to understand 
where to measure the um, roughness in between let's say low special frequencies to extract some kind of waviness power as well as to extract power change in uh, micro roughness. Now let's uh, move on to 2D materials which are uh, very um, our trend uh, nowadays. One of the critical point with 2D materials is it somehow it can be produced but you need to assess the quality and of course whenever you want to use them you need to understand where they are located as much as whether they match the right criteria. And usually using technologies like um, AFM, atomic force microscopy, is a bit slow uh, to screen out whether sample, uh, where samples are and what's uh, the most interesting uh, piece of 2D materials uh, are located. This is where wideline interferometry can help. So first of all, it helps by being able to navigate through the samples and I will show that during a short presentation at the end of uh, the third talk. Um, having a sample of, of graphene over a substrate, the fact that we have interferometric objective and the fact that light go through uh, the very thin layers of graphene uh, disturb, let's say, the light travel and this brings contrast uh, like a normasky like contrast. So you see an example of 5x low magnification objective where we nicely by nulling the fringes we see some kind of dark contrast or bright contrast wherever uh, graphene uh, layers are. And if we move to the 50x objectives already just by intensity and nulling fringes we start and also reveal uh, fine terraces and details without taking a measurement and we'll see later on that it, it is very specific up to some kind of model layers. So this uh, is one possibility already to really navigate through and find interesting locations. The second point is as I was mentioning the the light travel through so we may ask ourselves the question of whether we will measure topography and actually the the true scientific answer is no we won't get topography what we will get instead is a difference of optical paths so it will tell whether the light has traveled quickly like in air or whether the light has been slowed down uh, going through the graphene layers. And what you see on the left side is an example of a high lateral resolution um, image made with 115x objectives where you nicely see the substrate here on that part and the rest is the graphene uh, layers. And what we see here is some kind of arbitrary uniscale uh, which is a combination of change of refractive index and thickness, but you see some kind of nice details around. And to make sure uh, to be able to correlate the details, we measure the exact location with a dimension icon as an AFM with the peak force uh, tapping mode in order to get the true topography in that case. And what you see is exactly what we were anticipating already is we see the nice uh, terraces border and steps, we have the different layers being nicely emphasis in R2 optical. So we obtain exactly the same details. The point here is usually it, it takes uh, a few like uh, minutes to get there and while here you, you get uh, tens of seconds or less than a minute to have the, the result. But now the question is what do we really see? So if we look to the details of uh, uh, the AFM uh, structure, we see that we have almost a 300 nanometer thick layers. And on the top of that thick layers, if we take the sections, we will have very small subtle vertical changes. And in the green era, we have a change which is some uh, around uh, uh, 0.3 nanometers, which correspond to a single layer change on top of a tree almost 300 nanometer uh, size. If we do the same thing on optical image and that's a beauty uh, here is 
of course we see with the section that we see a big change of optical path which we understand because we have 300 nanometers of materials and here we see some kind of change of optical path around 400 um, arbitrary units but whenever we section on top very great details is we start and see this 0.6 nanometers we see it nicely with 1.4 arbitrary unit change and we see the single layers around 0.4 arbitrary uh, unit being spot out so we have here determined ability to detect and uh, single monolayers additions on top of almost 300 nanometer thick materials so it tells you this how sensitive white line interferometry technique can be to spot out this and now let's go to the real application the real application is to have ability to quickly screen out and check whether the graphene growth was uh, great or whether the graphene depositions over the silicon substrate has been properly made and whether we have good quality well in that case we will measure with low magnification objective like such as 5x objective we will cover in a w in the tens of seconds uh, 2.4 by 1.8 millimeter uh, square and have ability to automatically extract every single uh, monolayer so the deeper blue it is uh, the more monolayer it is and uh, in that case we can already exclude everything which is thicker and all spot out and have a statistic about the era the mean let's say uh, optical path difference we see uh, such as we can quickly get and elect the best location or the best uh, graphene layer we will further grab for the next uh, scientific uh, experiment for instance so this is a very elegant quick way um, to define the best uh, uh, monolayer or 2d materials the same and if you are interested to know more please refer to this nice uh, publications where they use uh, molybdenum disulfide monolayers they really plot um, the uh, monolayers uh, after layers sensitivity and you see that this is even stronger signal than just graphene and in that case uh, they also built thicker 2d materials and engrave it such as it plays the role of uh, micrometric uh, lens so micro lens with uh, 2d uh, layers in that case which is a great uh, transitions toward the detections of wavegate wa waveguide uh, through uh, white line interferometry and one of the key um, element is nowadays we want a faster and faster connection between uh, different uh, electronic uh, devices so you have like some kind of CPUs and ROM and you want an exchange in between um, the CPUs uh, a lot of information with a very high um, rate so in that case uh, we go and start to have Vexel lasers that propagate information uh, through WebGuide and the question is how do we ensure the WebGuides are, are great so most of the time you have let's say different ways to have create such a waveguide the first one is uh, a buried waveguide where you actually implant ions so it can be either through a physical mean like a, a, a ion beam or through a more liquid light and, and diffusing by uh, electrophoresis some ions but the main concept is to get higher concentrations of specific ions locally into few nanometers down to the surface and then after relaxing curing or annealing you create a certain areas which has a slightly different refractive index and the difference can be as small as um, 0.01 uh, in terms of refractive index so basically having uh, 1.5 1.50 as refractive index for silica few silica you may end up with here an index of 1.51 only but it's enough for the light to be guided uh, through 
The point is it's relatively easy to manufacture this uh, buried guy, however to assess the quality is really uh, painful. You, you need to do cross-sectioning, you need to do TM sometime, or you deduce from light propagations and see, uh, let's say, the spurious uh, light emissions along the guide, um, tell whether the guide is good or not. But it's, it's not really um, straightforward in, in that way. What can be uh, straightforward is use the white line interferometry. In that case, this is the same way as the 2D materials. We are looking through the surface, which is optically transparent to white light. So we're going through the, the glass uh, and define such a measurement where through the glass the light travel at a certain speed and whenever it meets the waveguide the travel of the light is slowed down. So basically that's the reason why it shows here in blue is like a channel because light travels slower so you have some kind of equivalent topography which corresponds to uh, a little dip. However, the key point is what you see is some kind of stronger blue, lighter blue, um, which reveal that uh, more or less here the waveguide gets maybe a thicker um, regions or uh, higher concentrations of uh, dopants, and the light part gets actually less. Uh, the good point with such an image, again, it takes a tens of seconds to take this image and then you can automatically extract all bench of information. So you can look for the uh, in-plane width and how the width fluctuates. So here we are uh, with around 3.4 plus minus 0.5 microns, which states that basically the line is continuous, otherwise uh, the standard deviation will be higher. Um, and then you can uh, have a look to what what is the the range of change. So you go from minus 8.9 nanometer uh, optical pass uh, difference all the way to uh, uh, minus 3.7. So you have quite a significant change of local dopant that will help you to further refine the doping technique or annealing process in order to get a perfect uh, waveguide. The other part is instead of having a buried waveguide is to use sub wavelength guide where you create uh, a specific regular structure so with a change of refractive index. In that case uh, for that publication they use silicon over silicon oxide. We can use the other way around which is uh, silicon oxide over silicon. And by positioning uh, this pattern properly uh, with respect to the wavelengths you want in convey, you can create uh, a perfect, uh, steady planner uh, guide for this wavelengths. Of course, the geometry and the spacing of that guide needs to be assessed. And this is where, um, again, white line and throwing tree profilers will play a role. We use um, another 15 next objective which are modes that collect multiple images uh, to the same time and uh, refine the lateral resolutions up to the limits of uh, what we can get. So the structure you see here is silicon oxide peter over uh, silicon and what we see is really optical pass uh, difference so this is exactly what lights will see. Uh, and what we see here is an, a closed hexagonal pattern of 200 nanometers um, uh, diameter holes spaced by uh, 900 nanometers. So you see how fine and how uh, far we push uh, the lateral um, resolution. And in that case, uh, it's easy for the scientist to automatically see whether the packing is right, whether the diameter is homogeneous, the spacing as well, as much as if you closely look to the surface, you see some kind of red moires over there. And this red moire states that the refractive index is locally higher or smaller. And in that case, this pattern uh, is responsible to the loss of light, basically having the light diffracted and no more guided on the planar ways. So you directly can uh, gauge and get a certain quantity 
of possible loss in correlate that with the loss you see once uh, you uh, shine the laser in and get uh, the input and output power difference. So it's an extremely elegant and powerful technique to get direct characterizations without any preparations or SEM uh, use in, in that case. Uh, so it's non-descriptive on, on top of that. Plus it probes the waveguide exactly with the with, uh, light, which is exactly uh, um, the use of it. So now let's move to uh, the uh, closed cell and having ability to control environmental parameters around the sample to see how topography evolves uh, life with the two uh, transmitted media uh, objectives. In essence, uh, white interferometry can, can work uh, and we, we have designed in, in the past or our customers and users have designed dedicated cells where you can encapsulate, let's say, MAM sensor, for instance, uh, or, or other uh, surfaces. The, you see here is this example of bulky uh, objective which is made to work together with uh, this cell because one of the key points is we have now to go through a certain windows which is usually a few squads or sapphire or high quality optical uh, window suitable for the environmental uh, conditions we like getting this into on top of the surface may create trouble for white light. Um, if we think about um, an anthropometric objective where we uh, split the light into two paths, one is uh, reflected from the sample, another one is reflected to the reference mirrors, um, and everything is reflected back to the camera, uh, which creates uh, some kind of destructive and constructive inferences. The point is, if we put an extra window there, there will be a shift in between the real focus on the surface and the present of fringe because the light will be slowed down by the presence of the window which is not present on the reference mirror. So what you end up is a very, very weak, uh, poor optical contrast of, of these features. and also, the fringes will be very faint, as you can see there, and it will be at a different vertical height. If you place inside the reference mirror exactly the same windows as you did, is everything works as if the sample was absolutely free, and you get back sharp optical contrast together with fringe, and you can adequately and nicely measured topography. So that's the main purpose of this true transmittive media objective is to have the flexibility to easily fit in there whatever windows needs to be uh, such as we compensate the presence of the other window. And in that case you can for instance uh, design this uh, nice uh, eating cooling chambers um, built uh, for one of our uh, Japanese users and what you see is the objective and there is a MAMS device which uh, needs to be characterized uh, in terms of shape at a different temperature and, and in that case we'll see whether the sensor will be still usable at that temperature or not. So what we can see now is we can measure at room temperature inside the, the cell and we, we nicely see uh, a large areas of 8.5 by 8.5 millimeter square and uh, the red means we have a certain curvatures uh, while the green is around the median plan and we have the blue which act as a reference uh, baseline. So it's some kind of uh, suspended or complex uh, sensor that if we put it to 200 degrees C uh, you see, because it's the same vertical scale, you see the curvature tend to be higher, there's a deformation there, as well as you see on the whole that we are going deeper, so there is some kind of a big contrast. Same happens here, in between holes we, we start and see some kind of changes that happens and start to distort uh, the wall profile. And finally, if we go all the way around with minus 45 degree, 
we see that the curvature is being compensated a bit uh, we uh, start to have a strong effect in between the holes revealing a, a strong difference of behaviors uh, along the diagonal of the hole compared to uh, where there is uh, full density uh, materials and if we do the same sections on the vertical regions uh, like this axis you will uh, clearly see uh, this impact of temperatures along the section where we see from the blue which is room temperature all the way to red which is high temperature we, we get a strong uh, effect having a higher bow and then uh, minus 45 brings uh, everything lower and you get also lateral shrinkage or expansion uh, depending of the, of the temperature uh, too which can be seen on that location so you get ability to characterize uh, the MEM sensors working at different temperature equally we can just work and measure uh, the change of uh, topography if uh, we move from um, let's say uh, air to vacuum however uh, this cell also works and uh, together with this TTM objective also works with liquids so in that case we will need to take into account uh, the window thickness as well as, as the thickness of liquid such as we can measure uh, the topography and get the best uh, optical and fringe contrast and in that case one of the points uh, uh, let's say studied by uh, Oslo University is to understand how calcite grow and dissolve uh, because calcite is one of the promoter for um, carbon dioxide storage so the idea is we pump from the atmosphere the carbon dioxide and reduce then uh, the risk for temperature uh, increase over the globe and uh, in that case the study how in uh, slightly acidic solutions uh, the calcite uh, was dissolving so they were able to measure the height uh, difference between the calcite and reference surfaces at a different time by measuring with interferometry uh, the, the topography and deducing then uh, the um, dissolutions uh, rate versus different locations and you can see this 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 curve in terms of change of um, height uh, versus time and the reason why they use white line interferometry in that case uh, was the need for really sub nanometer vertical resolution because we want to get the high sensitivity and chi size very slowly uh, grow or dissolves which makes uh, sense to have very high sensitivity if you don't want experiment to last uh, days or, or year so this is a good example of operation liquid whenever you work in liquids and combine this together with temperature control then you can start and play with living cell and this was the sorry unexpected yeah so this was a case for uh, the team uh, from um, uh, California and they uh, grow uh, living cells onto a cover slip and put uh, them into an observation chambers and the idea was to disperse some nickel bowl uh, such as you could potentially press over the cells by bringing the magnet in and out and in that case what you see here is a nice topography image where you see this red spot which is like the protrusions of the bead and whenever the bead is located there you can potentially measure x y not only x y position but the vertical position so whenever you uh, start to press and put magnets the bead will be attracted downward pushing the cells down and in that case you can then remove uh, the effect uh, of the magnet and release it so what you see is 
you press and see how the cell reacts under the pressure and release the pressure so you see how much and how fast the whole cell recovers. So you're doing locally some real G depending on different cells so you have different behavior of the cells as well as different location of the beads on uh, maybe different organelles. But of course you can also check internally how the cytoskeleton of the cell um, reorganized under the pressure. So here you have a cell where you have two nickel beads and you cycle over uh, more than three minutes uh, regular forces into this. And what you see here is a not a topography, it is simply uh, the change of optical path. So again, uh, whenever the light travel to a higher density location, it is further slowed down compared to a location with low density. And then you can see how the, let's say, density of the cell evolves time after time. And then you can, from the start and from the end, you can uh, deduce and subtract images to see where uh, the density or, uh, has changed. And what you see is definitely you get some rearrangements around, especially here around the beads, just to secure and telling that the cell was able to reorganize organelles, stress fibers, in order to bring more resistance uh, underneath the, the beads. So that's uh, pretty interesting um, to, to get uh, such a science uh, where we use light to travel through and gain information about local density. So as uh, you have seen with this quick overview, uh, white light interferometer profilers can still be used to uh, finely um, characterize the surface textures. Uh, but using the sub-nanometer vertical resolution and sub-micron lateral resolutions, we can expand this to let's say poor spectrum densities understand um, how corrosion process plays a role as much as you can start really modes where you simply use uh, the optical path difference such as you measure 2d materials web guys or density changes over living cells also you can use cloth cell such as you control uh, pressure, vacuum, temperature or fluid around the sample in order to study dynamics, uh, kinetics uh, and have very still precise vertical and lateral information. And as you will see with uh, other presentations, especially uh, the one coming from Alexander, uh, we can uh, use and, and characterize more and even more whenever we start to combine with um, different techniques such as micro Ryman or AFM, we gain extra um, information. So now it's time for me um, to uh, hand over uh, the presentations uh, over... Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, I'd like to uh, change presenter and uh, go after uh, Alexander from uh, KIT, uh, such as he can start his uh, presentations. So, Alexander, are you in? We see your presentations. So it's a real pleasure to, to welcome uh, uh, Alexander. Uh, he will present to you the use of white light interferometry uh, for label-free detection of peptide antibodies uh, interactions. So thanks for your participations and please go ahead, uh, Alexander. Hello, uh, Samuel, thank you very much for a very nice presentation and uh, many thanks to Brooker for uh, organization of this webinar. As said in this presentation, we will speak about Brooker optical profilometer to detect peptide antibody interactions. Uh, first, uh, about motivation. The human body has a large amount of proteins with important functions and peptides are nothing else at short fragments of these proteins and peptides are constructed 
with only 20 uh, different uh, biogenic uh, amino acids. It's very interesting property of antibodies that they can bind uh, specifically to small peptides according to uh, key log uh, principle. This allows for antibody detection and profiling in a uh, high throughput manner using uh, peptide arrays. Uh, different combinations of these actually 20, only 20 biogenic amino acids are responsible for the whole diversity of proteins in the human body. So, uh, we can produce many different peptides arranged in uh, peptide spots on the microscope slides and uh, we will know exactly uh, what kind of uh, amino acid sequence we, ha we have uh, in uh, each sport. Um, our research group and uh, our spin-off company, Accelera, in cooperation with uh, AI industry, developed a peptide content that covers the entire human proteome in form of overlapping peptides. And using this, we can conduct actually proteome-wide antibody profiling or antibody cross-reactivity studies on a single uh, microscope uh, slide. Uh, Accelera held, has uh, developed also uh, automated microarray synthesizer and um, to produce uh, ultra-high density peptide microarrays. Uh, this machine can produce libraries of approximately 0 0.5 millions of 15 meric peptides uh, within uh, a week. Uh, why actually optical uh, profiler matter? As a rule, uh, antibodies should be labeled to see them on the chip. Uh, it could be fluorescence molecules uh, attached to antibodies directly or secondary labeled antibodies. Here, for example, is the first variation. But fluorescence labels are sometimes complicated. Uh, frequently, the fluorescence signals uh, cannot correlate to real concentration of uh, absorbed molecules. This is a problem, uh, for example, because of the quenching effects. By occasion, it was only occasion that we have at our institute Brooker optical profiler meta, and we just wanted to try it for label free detection of antibodies, and we were surprised about the results. Uh, what we did uh, is a simple workflow as uh, shown uh, here. We took known peptides uh, and uh, blood serum. Uh, with antibodies inside, we coupled peptides covalently via spotting and incubated uh, this chip with uh, uh, serum with different dilutions. Then we used uh, Brooker profiler matter optical to obtain a very nice label-free uh, signals of uh, antibodies. Then, uh, together with Richard Thelen, who will shortly describe after me the correlation measurements, we compared the A if uh, M uh, measurements uh, versus uh, uh, optical profilometer for uh, VSI uh, measurements, and we found actually it's what what were also very nice a strong correlation in the heights of the accumulated uh, antibodies uh, measured via both uh, techniques. Here. Uh, at the top, we see uh, a graphic. The x-axis is actually uh, common for both graphics, is uh, the serum dilution. At large uh, dilutions uh, of the uh, blood serum, the antibody concentration is low. And uh, at high, uh, it is the concentration is very, uh, uh, very high, actually real, as uh, in a blood sample. Um, as we see, the height of antibody level increases with increasing the antibody concentrations in the serum and gets into a situation 
if the antibodies occupied uh, all peptides uh, in the spots, this is the saturation regime. On the other side, if you look at the uh, graphic at the bottom, it shows us fluorescence intensity, fluorescence signals, and we see here this uh, decreasing of the signal in saturation regime, which can be caused by fluorescence quenching of densely packed uh, antibody uh, layer. Here, once again, uh, we see the first graphic. It means uh, the optical measurement of the heights of accumulated antibody layers with this um, serum dilution. And this simple formula that we have derived in our paper just explains the function the, the, that is uh, measured by optical profilometer. Delta H is here the height of the accumulated antibody layers. Delta H Z is the height in saturation regime. Lambda is the average wavelength used for the measurement. And delta, it is average distances, distance between the two molecules uh, absorbed. If the delta is small, it means the distance between the absorbed molecules is small, the antibody layer is dense, then we see the delta H is delta H saturation. We are in saturation regime. In the case of large dilution, uh, the height uh, is proportional to the li linear pro linearly proportional to the uh, dilution. And we have studied this uh, in our paper, and we can say that in this linear regime, we can even use um, VSE to measure uh, affinities of antibodies if the concentrations are known. My uh, last slide uh, here, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of members of my research team, as well as uh, thank uh, the funding uh, organizations. Now I am happy to hand over this presentation to Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this great uh, presentation. Oh, yeah. And now you go for uh, yeah. Richard. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes. So, hi, everybody, and welcome. So I'm Richard, I'm also part of the KIT, and here is my presentation, and I'm talking about what did we learn from the project. So the, it is very interesting to see, we really, as uh, Alexander just showed, we if you look at the two data uh, two data sets of a wildlife interferometer and EFM picture, it's hard to see which one is, is from what machine because they are so close to each other. The dev deviation is in the really sub-nanometer range and that is was something that we did not expect and it was impressive to see. So our idea, idea is if we have machines that, that have high resolution, how can we combine them for the benefit of, both, of all of us? So, and the idea is if we have high reproducibility of machines, and we can address a, a spot or a location very good, we can use a system to address a location and then uh, subsequently measure with different machinery. And as we are a really large uh, research facility uh, like uh, the KIT, we have one group that is called K uh, KNMF and that includes already 28 high technologies. So we have a, a, the best conditions to start thinking about how to include more. And that is what I'm now showing very shortly. So if you want to connect different machines and get results from different perspective, you have to look at different topics like how to prepare your sample so that it can uh, be subsequently measured or, or treated. You need a really 3D metrology because if you keep everything into a plane, uh, a lot of samples are um, ex excluded and that's something we don't want that. But on the other hand, if you start thinking about a 3D metrology, the, the referencing is very much harder than just keeping in plane, because keeping in plane means you have three markers, you look at them, you calculate the position and then everything is done. If you look at a 3D representation, it's very much harder. Once you have that, you can have a sample 
you generate a 3D depiction of that and then you transfer this information to the next machine to address on that representation where actually your next measurement is going to be done. And at the end you have data from different machines, from different manufacturers, extremely different and varying format and then you have to compare that to merge them, to superpose them and, and to finalize them by analyzing what's what can be seen within that data. And this is something we are trying to do. So we we have some very easy requirements as seen here. I won't read that, but just we have to have some standardization to get it done. That is what you see. Then of course for the from the software point of view there is even more to think about because uh, what is what is good if you have a lot of data without any comp compatibility? You, ca you cannot compare uh, surface data directly with some spectroscopy data. You have to think about how to cleverly merge them. And that is something that will take uh, a few years to, to get done. And at the end, that is where we are now. We have started this uh, end of last uh, year. We have already uh, four systems connected. This is an AFM and VSI. That was the initial uh, for these activities. We have a spectroscope integrated and a, an optical microscope. So we have a carrier defined. We have uh, at some points made minor adaptations for the carrier because this carrier does, is, as the name tells it, it's from one company, doesn't fit to everybody else. So we have a specific carrier even for samples with um, different uh, recommendations. We, know, we now have ex access partially to the equipment manufacturer data that we need to transfer data and merge the, uh, the format that we create. We have uh, started doing a, creating an infrastructure for the database that we need to, to connect all of that. And one of our PhD students is e extremely busy uh, doing software interfaces and video overlays from the different uh, machines. And we are quite uh, hopeful that we are having uh, this uh, set up soon in a running condition. So we have equipment from different manufacturer. We have a net network architecture. We have software as well professional, as well as some patches that we still need because what we try to do is not yet uh, available on the market. And of course, we have driven people. And all that is, from my perspective, the idea of how the future of metrology at our research institute should be like. And with that, I'm finishing my talk and you're all in, invited to look at the homepage of the KNMF and to see, as this is an open infrastructure, if we can do something for you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for this uh, uh, nice uh, presentation combining all the technology. I think it, it will make a perfect uh, transitions uh, for uh, Lulga and uh, uh, Andreas to have uh, uh, exposed what we can do and how we can mobilize this uh, overlay um, in there. Okay, so the floor is yours, uh, Andreas. We see you on the webcam, we see your presentations and uh, you just need to go to the um, slide presentation mode. Yep, here we are. So, hello, and uh, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to talk today about steel corrosion kinetics, studied by Raman coupled uh, vertical scanning interferometry. And uh, I'm very excited about the, the first two talks. What, what I heard uh, is kind of a dream coming true. Um, we have worked the last, I think, more than 20 years now on uh, utilizing vertical scanning interferometry for a number of different applications. Um, because we think, and I like this uh, the sentence here from Albert Einstein very much, we can solve problems by using the same kind 
of thinking we used when we created them. It's a very uh, important uh, thing that always drove our uh, uh, desire to kind of develop new uh, applications. Um, so let's take a fresh look here and uh, I will give you a brief overview of what we are doing not only in Bremen, I think I started that at Yale University, you went for 15 years, I think, to Rice University. So there's about 20 years of research. We have done nanotechnology. If you work at Rice, you have to do nanotechnology. Uh, microbiology, we saw a nice application already. Um, and today, materials um, and, and steel corrosion. Um, I'm myself a mineralogist. Uh, with some geochemistry background. And um, the general concept that we're using is imaging. So everything is kind of based on, on imaging, specifically on uh, white light interferometry. I think it's a, it's a fantastic uh, technology, uh, extremely fast data acquisition, uh, very high um, vertical resolution, reasonable lateral resolution. And when I came to Bremen about what eight years ago now, I decided that it would be a good idea to couple that interferometry technique with, uh, with Raman. And uh, Bruker was kind enough to, uh, together with Rainy Shaw to kind of work with us. Um, and so we developed the first prototype that is uh, in the MAPEX core facility uh, in, in Bremen. Now, and you can actually access that through the MAPEX core facility if you have some kind of application. And in our everyday business, we are utilizing that in, uh, in agreement or in, uh, how should I say, complementary with, with atomic force microscopy. And I will give you some examples. That's just one half of what we're doing. The other is computer calculations using kinetic Monte Carlo simulations to predict the behavior of fluid-solid interactions. And so for us, the imaging part is really critical because we need uh, this technology to parameterize our uh, computer codes and do also the validation of, of the computer models. Um, you can read about this, this kind of work, different applications, uh, that we have done um, in the number of, of articles. I think we have now more than 200 or so articles in the last few years due to the nice uh, imaging, uh, we were able to make some, um, some covers of journals. And today I want to focus on a, a study that was done actually by Janis Heuer, it was his research project in our um, uh, materials chemistry and mineralogy track. So on his way to his master, he did this, this study and it got published in materials degradation. So most of the stuff I give you in terms of the steel, you will be able to uh, reread uh, in case you want um, in this, in this nice, nice little paper. So interferometry is for us kind of a center technology. Uh, because you can see here, this is time on the on the y-axis and length on the x-axis. Um, we typically face problems that are decided at the at the atomic level, at the angstrom to nanometer level. Um, but we have to scale that up for material science and earth science, particularly earth science um, problems into the even kilometer range. And you can see that interferometry here bridges for us the very small scale um, questions with actually the experimental bulk side and, and field studies. So it becomes really the center uh, and then is complemented by techniques like atomic force uh, microscopy. If we go to smaller scale uh, questions, we typically use ab initio. Um, um, parameterized kinetic Monte Carlo simulations. So today I want to focus on the experimental side of the story and particularly on vertical scanning interferometry in combination with Raman spectroscopy. 
If you are interested in some more background, uh, how interferometry, white light interferometry really works, I can refer you to this uh, nice little paper. Rolf Arvidsson made a real effort here um, to give uh, some significant background, uh, theoretically as well as practical. And uh, we were at that time interested in lateral resolution enhancement. And Samuel has talked a bit about um, the importance of uh, lateral resolution in interferometry, and uh, here you may find also some ideas that, that we worked on for about five years or so. The, for me, great advantage of, of white light interferometry is that it can make, uh, that it can measure very large height differences, in this case, 1,000 uh, um, micrometers, uh, sorry, 1,000 nanometers, one micrometer, but you can, can go to, to uh, several dozen uh, micrometers in height with a very high resolution. So on the same data set, you have all this information here. Uh, so we can be typically at a one nanometer resolution or even down to the angstrom uh, resolution. If we need more, then we can kind of focus on this little corner here, for example, and utilize atomic force microscopy to uh, have an even closer look to, to our problems. So we can quantify surface area very precisely and very nicely. Um, the resolution up here is also in the one nanometer range. Okay, so um, one micron with a resolution of better than a nanometer is no problem. The second advantage is we are very fast. Right? We can measure this within seconds or even fractions of seconds. Uh, we have a fairly large field of view um, and get nice information about 3D topography. And you have seen that already in Samuel's talk. We are interested in the reaction kinetics. How does a surface interact with a fluid? And that can be corrosion, dissolution, or even growth, the deposition of material onto the surface or the crystal growth, for example. Um, and we want to quantify the rates of these, of these processes. So we need to go from a static view of the surface to a dynamic measurement of the changes of surface as a function of time. So it has explained nicely how that is done. Okay, I want to show you here in an overview um, how we do that. Actually, we measure the surface at time t1. We have a reference, and the reference does not change. That's a prerequisite uh, over time. So, and then we measure the surface again at time t2. Okay, and now we go a step further. We line up the surface at T1 and T2. So these data files here, we line them up exactly and subtract them from each other. The result is that we get a height difference at every IJ coordinate of our data file. Right? So we can kind of scan this through and we move here from a picture, an image, to a 3D um, height data file. So quantitative uh, data. So what we measure is this height difference. Okay, the height difference, the delta height, as a function of, of time. And that is nothing else, as you can see, as velocity. So it's the velocity normal to the surface that the surface retreats in case of uh, corrosion or advances in case of crystal growth. So, if you take now this velocity at every pixel, at every uh, measurement coordinate, ij, and divide it by the molar volume of the material that you are corroding or growing, right, then you get what we call the intrinsic rate, or some people call that the rate constant. Right? The intrinsic rate in moles per meter squared per second. And the big advantage that we have is that this uh, approach circumvents the problem of external quantifying surface area. 
Uh, that is a real tricky part, as uh, many of you may know. Uh, you can use BET technology, but you know that if you use different gases, then um, we get different answers. Uh, if we use uh, geometric surface area versus total surface area, you always get a different answer for the total surface area uh, that you would need to normalize that because we have moles per meter squared per second. In this case, with this approach, you have circumvented that problem entirely. And here is a result. You see a calcite surface. Some of you already talked about calcite dissolution is a very critical mineral. For us, actually, it's a very fast dissolving mineral. It dissolves this typically 10 to the minus 6 moles per meter squared per second, while silicates, uh, like feldspars, for example, dissolve with 10 to the minus 25. And that's why we need that uh, very high vertical resolution of white light uh, interferometry. And you can see here, with, uh, as this movie kind of uh, zooms through several times, how the surface is evolving over time. And you get a pretty good idea what's happening, what drives that. In this case, it's screw dislocations at the bottom of these pits that kind of drives this, uh, this dissolution process. However, what we want actually is we want numbers. Right? We want hard cold numbers that we can uh, utilize to do statistics, to kind of uh, derive overall dissolution rates and things like that. Here comes uh, our so-called rate spectra approach um, into uh, play that uh, we have developed in the last five, six, seven years. Cornelius Fischer, who is now at Leipzig, at the Helmholtz Institute there, um, has driven that, that quite a bit. We think this is a pathway to a better approach of um, quantifying uh, reaction kinetics at surfaces. At the basis here, we are measuring the surface topography, as I have shown you in the preceding slides. So we do an experiment. Um, or we do take a field study, you can do that um, in situ, you can do that ex situ, or what we call quasi in situ, and you measure this topography development as a function of time. Every two of these measurements give you a material flux map, okay, that is the difference between these two uh, surfaces, right, and you can see this is pretty much the amount of material that corrodes away into the solution. Um, or if you do a crystal growth or a material deposition uh, process, that kind of gets deposited onto the surface. Now what we do is we sort all these data into a histogram. And as a result, we are getting a 3D um, we're getting a 3D information here into a, spec, uh, into a spectrum, right? And this is nothing else than the number of pixels at a given or measured uh, rate. So we see here the rate distribution across our measured surface. Now you can see that the process is actually changing. What you also see is that the typical mean that we would take here, right, uh, hardly represents what's really going on. When we go now to a kind of steel corrosion, um, we would see that the average rate, the rate constant, if you want so, um, would not give us a correct answer, right, because you would think this is your steel material, your steel surface, and you would calculate some kind of uh, uh, resistance uh, time, uh, lifetime pretty much of this material. What kills that material here are these rates, right? the, the really fast rates that creates the pits. Right? And that's why the pipeline, for example, would, would fail. So at this point, uh, Janis Hoyer um, uh, decided to, to do a study on pipeline steel. Okay, before I will give you some, some more information, I will show you here um, a sequence from 3 to 32 hours 
uh, of a different material uh, that that Elizabeth Pedrosa actually did. And you see, you can do all these nice uh, uh, flux maps here that gives you precisely the amount of material that you are removing locally resolved uh, between these time intervals here between three and six hours, for example, or 24 and 32 hours. Um, if you get into details, right, then you can kind of pick this partial area here and see what's going on here compared to what's going on here. And you get a quantitative uh, tool that allows you to look pretty much at the reaction kinetics spatially resolved. While you can, of course, do an average for the entire sample, and you can take several samples, you have with one measurement typically 4 million data points. So if you subtract two measurements, you get 4 million, um, 4 million um, material flux data. And then you can do full statistics of your reaction kinetics and see how reactive your material is, what is the variability, and uh, how does it change over time. At this point, we thought to bring in actually the, uh, the uh, Raman uh, spectroscopy. So we combine a vertical scanning interferometer, in this case a Buka GT system, with a rainy Shaw spectrometer that is equipped with two laser um, systems. One that we used here is a 532 nanometer green laser. And you can measure actually the surface topography, and the change of surface topography with the white light profiler. And then you move that in between or at the end as you like. Um, you can go back and forth to the Renishaw uh, Raman spect uh, spectrometer and get an idea about the chemistry and the change of chemistry in the surface. Right? And that is shown here. You have the underlying 3D uh, height map, topography map of this material. In this case, it's a, it's a aluminosilicate, um, what we call a feldspar. And we overlaid that here um, with the Raman information, and you can see, clearly see here this X solution lamellae, right? And you can see the different chemistry of this X solution uh, uh, lamellae uh, with respect to the host uh, crystal. You can do that quantitatively uh, and uh, look at that Raman uh, spectrum. See this here in, in more detail. Um, you can completely analyze that if you like. And uh, this is what Janis Hoyer took pretty much for his study on an API X70 steel that is a steel that is typically used for pipelines, right? And we exposed that to a 3.5 weight percent uh, NaCl solution. And we can go back and forth here between the VSI measurement and the Raman uh, analysis. And that's what, uh, what uh, uh, Janis did. And what you see here is that with corrosion, it's a bit difficult or more difficult than if you have just a dissolution process because you are also forming some what people typically call rust, right? So the actually corrosion products are precipitating directly um, on top of the retreating surface. So in this case, Janis uh, decided to remove this uh, rust material after the measurements, and then he was able to actually measure the surface normal retreat. That is actually uh, gives us the true steel surface after the corrosion process. Here you can see some, some of these results. This is now the Raman map. Uh, centered around uh, oh, 670 um, one over centimeters, I think. Here is the light optical image of the surface, and uh, we see um, mainly magnetoid that is then surrounded here by uh, iron oxides and hydroxides. 
So you get a clear information about the, the chemistry of the corrosion products. Right? You see the distribution that is not homogeneously. Um, and we can also see the surface topography measurement here with these little particles that uh, the interferometer actually resolves. And then if this is all dissolved uh, and removed with, in this case, Clark's solution, right, we see here the uh, topography of the corroded surface. And you can see what you did not uh, imagine here, that you have actually two uh, deep pits that um, uh, drive the, the corrosion process of this, of this steel material. Okay, then we can kind of analyze, as I have seen, as I have shown you, um, the different rates spatially resolved in our spectrum. And you can see again, this is the mean rate that we would typically uh, publish at our K, or the dissolution rate um, constant for this material. But you see, you have rates that are several times faster. Okay, for a pipeline, this would be the dangerous part, and we can kind of analyze that, and we can predict uh, how fast that will corrode the the wall of this uh, the steel wall of the of the pipeline, um, and eventually that could help to avoid disasters like like uh, in in Alaska and some of the the oil companies, uh, or actually all oil companies have. Some, some issues, I think, with, with uh, pipeline corrosion. Okay, that is my uh, overview here of uh, this, this approach. Um, if you want more details, please feel free to send me email, ask questions here, um, and I refer you again to the, to the publications. I have some take-home messages. We took a fresh look. Raman coupled vertical scanning interferometry is a powerful tool that allows quantification of surface topography, rate changes, so we can do the kinetics. We can measure at the same time the surface chemistry and the change in surface chemistry as a function of our experimental or environmental conditions. Well, we can do that in situ, we can do that ex situ, um, and we can do that what we call quasi in situ. That is pretty much when we do the corrosion in an open cell without a window and we blow that fluid for a couple of seconds away with a nitrogen jet. And then we do the measurement and the flow returns over that, that surface. Um, we can use that to experiment for experimental validation for computer models, particularly if you do kinetic Monte Carlo uh, computer models. You need parameterization and you need independent validation of the model results. So with all this, we can explore the limits of spectral distribution, both in frequency and contact. And thus, this helps us to develop realistic predictive tools. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, for this uh, nice talk. I also like to thank uh, uh, everyone having participated there. So now it's time to have uh, quick sessions about uh, a question you ask uh, along. And uh, one of the questions uh, uh, we had was uh, uh, about how uh, fast is, is the measurement. So uh, now the, the main idea is to quickly show to you um, how long it takes to uh, hunt for uh, 2D materials uh, and uh, over a silicon surface like uh, graphene. So what you see here is um, an interface of uh, the, the system and uh, what we have is we have different objective uh, uh, available. So the, the first things we need to, to, to do after is to uh, go and uh, check to, to find the surface so here there's an automatic um, uh, focus function that to help us to automatically find uh, the, the surface. So what you see is uh, we are using a 5x uh, objective that helps us to see multiple square millimeters around and we can really uh, define and, and check maybe uh, different locations 
uh, where we like to, to go. And as I was uh, uh, mentioning uh, already, the, the fact that we are using interferometric uh, objectives uh, really help us to uh, gain some uh, contrast whenever we are uh, we knew the, the, the fringes uh, uh, already uh, over there. So now what we can uh, go for is let's say uh, define a, a certain uh, interesting uh, graphene we are uh, in. Uh, we can uh, let's say refocus uh, on that specific location before to uh, jump to a higher uh, magnification and gain in that way lateral uh, resolution. So uh, if we really want and, and see some kind of uh, uh, fringes uh, here we can re readjust and really see uh, how big the, the contrast is in, in that case. So now if I, I move toward the uh, Android 15x uh, uh, objective uh, the system will uh, uh, move uh, there and uh, we can uh, uh, of course uh, as well uh, uh, go for uh, slightly downward and find the, the surface to, to make sure we, we got uh, uh, the proper uh, focus on this uh, graphene layers in um, silicon. So once we are on uh, focus we can just bring a bit more light and uh, we will uh, right away see uh, that we stand on this uh, graphene uh, flakes. So we can further zoom out and, and see maybe uh, a, a bigger area uh, such as we, we are more center in uh, um, specific uh, locations. So we see already uh, some kind of nice contrast where we see that there will be multiple uh, terraces uh, there. and. Uh, then we can uh, uh, just uh, uh, bring uh, along and uh, uh, see whether by refining uh, fringes here we have the uh, uh, intensity and uh, start uh, simply the, the measurement. So why the system vertically scan it rebuilt uh, live the surface so scanning just took a couple of seconds uh, for that graphene and uh, now the system is post-processing uh, the, the data uh, such as uh, we have a mode where we gain sub-nanometer vertical uh, resolution. So what you see is uh, now a nice uh, 3D uh, map uh, of the surface which is not the topography but more optical path. So uh, we see that uh, we have blue uh, scales uh, we have great uh, limits uh, in there, we see some pitting, we see also a nice uh, orientation of uh, crystal along a crystallographic axis uh, in that triangle. Or, but now we, we, we will just simply take the, the proper reference plane which is the, the silicon part and for that we, we will uh, adequately remove uh, a force order polynomial uh, in that case over uh, a specific uh, era so we can uh, define let's say a, a nice big eras uh, uh, around and make sure that uh, we uh, determine uh, a reference regions a bit like whenever we were in dissolutions uh, we were uh, getting some reference surfaces and now here we go you, you nicely see now the graphene layers in the different terraces and if we want to check further on the uh, downward we can see a top view we can maybe zoom in in this interesting uh, areas in this interesting areas uh, we nicely see some kind of specific terraces um, and in that case we can look for having a nice let's say averaging there and what we see here is vertically we define a changes of 16 nanometer in uh, optical pass differences uh, or down to that one we, we can start and see just few uh, nanometer and you see how well the step are determined such as we can really look for very very uh, uh, small uh, differences like uh, over there for instance uh, 
uh, and then in that case you have even smaller uh, uh, differences which is uh, around uh, two three uh, nanometers so this is um, how the technique works and how easy it is to operate nowadays uh, with white light um, profilers so I can open up uh, the uh, questions uh, over there and uh, uh, Robert do you have already specific questions to um, bring to my attention yeah there was one question uh, that that was asked in particular with regards to the measurements done with the peptides since some of the Z resolutions were uh, on the order of a of tens of nanometers was it PSI or VSI used to do those measurements it was definitely uh, uh, combined PSI and phase shift imaging. So we, we did both. White light uh, is not enough, so we have to need PSI, but due, due to the fact that the slide at the larger scale, scan range is not even enough to measure PSI only without phase jumps, we do the combined mode. Yeah, so this is exactly the mode I've shown here which consists of a vertical scanning but still using phase information such as we have let's say sub nanometer vertical resolution so we can combine large gap of few microns or tens of microns while still keeping sub nanometer vertical resolution so combining vertical scanning interferometry and phase shifting interferometry um, so in, in uh, almost all the presentation I saw it was a vertical scanning interferometry or this combined mode which is now called universal scanning interferometry on uh, uh, our side um, on during my presentations I mentioned um, that for the waveguide I was instead uh, using pure phase shifting uh, this was the sole case where uh, phase shifting was uh, uh, in use Okay, thank you. And then there's another question here uh, for Andreas on how are the measurements aligned laterally? There are many measurements, many hours apart, so one would expect some drift or alignment errors. So I think this is a, a general oh. question on the measurement setup. Right. Um, I mean, we have uh, fiducials on the, on the uh, uh, sample sample holder uh, we use this um, for the data reduction that uh, we're doing to kind of uh, subtract one measurement from the other uh, we do that um, through our own software that uh, uses also our um, reference surface that that we are using uh, we do that a bit different um, you can, and uh, in this case of the steel uh, sample, Janis did that. Uh, he used pretty much the embedding material that was inert in that case. In most cases, um, it is very hard to find an inert material. So what we are using is actually is, uh, different types of cement or glue that we use to apply micron-sized spots on the surface. And we're utilizing actually the um, the original surface underneath as an internal reference. And then while we are doing these measurement intervals, uh, we remove these uh, masks uh, from the surface one by one and uh, utilizing the surface underneath as, as a reference. Okay, thank you. Uh, those were the questions that we have. Just in general, um, this session is being recorded for the other que uh, more tactical questions that were asked by the community that's uh, joined us. Thank you. Yeah, also I had a question uh, where uh, someone asked here, how does it come that we can reach 200 nanometers true lateral resolutions? Um, uh, with just uh, a central wavelength of 600 nanometers it's uh, far away from Landau over two um, here the idea of the uh, measurement mode of white line interferometry is we have an unprecedented vertical resolution and uh, in uh, some occasion with this uh, 
vertical scanning mode we call it VXI or we can call it the USI there is a uh, inherently sub nanometer vertical resolution such as we define every point in a 3D space uh, with a very high vertical resolution let's say so if we repeat the measurements and use correlative algorithm uh, such a vertical resolution will help us to refine actually the lateral resolution down to the uh, diffraction limits uh, such as we can really see uh, 200 nanometers uh, details and, and speaking about lateral resolutions whenever we say in that case we reach up to 150 nanometers lateral resolution this means we can resolve two lines separated by 150 nanometers so in most of occasions uh, optical um, technique uh, like confocal prefer to speak of half of it so it goes to 75 nanometers so uh, white line interferometry techniques not only scope with uh, a multiple order vertical uh, resolution going to let's say hundreds of microns to sub nanometers uh, which uh, is already almost a four order uh, five order magnitudes but also it goes to uh, tens of millimeters all the way to uh, hundreds of nanometers that's that the key uh, takeaway from uh, that uh, type of uh, presentations and that's the reason why it can be applied for advanced uh, materials as much as advanced characterization of those new materials because it has unique uh, uh, capabilities covering large field of view getting some nanometer vertical resolution and still pushing the lateral resolutions uh, up to uh, the limit so I'd like to thank uh, everyone uh, who attended the, the sessions if there are more questions feel free to contact us um, at uh, samuel.lesco at brooker.com uh, and uh, we will uh, uh, in the coming uh, days distribute a link where you could have access to uh, the recording thanks again to um, Andreas and Alexander to have participated and to uh, be uh, our uh, guest uh, speaker today um, please uh, stay tuned uh, there are uh, many coming uh, technical webinars from Bruker uh, dealing with atomic force microscopy, uh, nano annotations, uh, tribology. So uh, feel free to uh, uh, attend and apply for this. Have a nice uh, evening, a nice uh, day, depending on the uh, location you are. And uh, looking forward to uh, see you soon. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you.